Beam boom bum boom. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Servants. Today we will be covering a modern heroic spirit and one that's Halloween CE spawned a million dojins and cosplays, the Nurse of Steel herself, Florence Nightingale. Her role in history is one that should not be downplayed, and by some of her critics it certainly has. She was the poster child for the nursing revolution that occurred in the late 1800s, and her pledge is one that is still done by modern nurses today. She was a key figure in making nurses more than just maids for the dying, and rather stewards and caretakers to those who are suffering. She is the reason why training to be a nurse now requires so much more work, and as a result, has saved countless lives. But let's start from the beginning. Florence Nightingale was born on the 12th of May, 1820, in the city of Florence. She would be named after this city, and lived there for only about a year before her parents moved back to England. Being from a wealthy lot, her parents could afford to be more humanitarian, and raise their daughter as such. Nightingale was born into the very fortunate situation of her parents being wealthy, yet despite this she did not attend a school, and instead she and her sister were taught by her father. Similar to the situation of Chin Liang Yu, her father was very much a supporter of pro-woman ideas, and trained his daughters in all the various classics of education. Florence took to her studies quite well and developed a keen analytical eye. Then, on a trip to Paris, the Nightingale family met with a family friend named Mary Clark. To sum her up, she was a high-class tomboy. She cared not for the fineries of the upper class, nor the company of women, and instead favored being around men who could challenge her intellectually. She was crass but never disrespectful. She made an exception to her dislike of women for the Nightingale family and Florence, whom she would bond with. She taught Florence by example that a woman could stand on her own two feet and be just as successful as a man could. This would be a huge influence on Nightingale and the pair would remain close friends for decades. At the age of 24, Florence announced to her family that she wanted to be a nurse. This idea was met with flat out rejection by her more traditionalist mother and sister. Despite this, she believed herself to be on a mission from God to assist others in need. So she took her education by the horns and began her training as a nurse. This journey would eventually lead her to Rome, where she would meet a former secretary of war by the name of Sidney Herbert. The two would hit it off quite well and became close friends. Though she did not know it yet, he would be an integral figure in getting her into the war front of Crimea later on in her life. Let's step back a bit. Some may believe that Faith's portrayal of Nightingale is a bit overkill. In the game, she's a near fanatical hypochondriac whose only desire in life is to cure the ill, even if that means killing them. Well, her demeanor was described as such in real life. She was attractive and charming, but she spoke severely, though not rudely. She had a radiant smile. So, in a way, Fate takes this severe form of speech and mixes it with her incredible determination to get where she believes she should be, and the fact that she was completely shattering the social norm for the time, and yeah, I can see why they decided on a berserker for her. Anyway, Nightingale kept traveling, because at this time, global travel for rich people was at a peak. Helena Blavatsky was another figure who did this at the time as well, though it would be a few decades later. Nightingale went from Greece to Egypt, where she would write about the great temples that she saw, and eventually ended up in Thebes, where she would have a holy premonition, supposedly. In a letter to her sister, she wrote this, quote, God called me in the morning and asked me, would I do good for him alone without reputation? End quote. Continuing her travels, she wound up in Germany, where she witnessed the healing works of a Lutheran minister. This would be something she held on to for her entire life. This minister was a man by the name of Theodore Fliedner. To understand Nightingale's future, it is important to understand who Fliedner was. Fliedner had noticed that there was a lack of hospitals and people capable of aiding the sick. So, Fliedner founded an institution with the express purpose of teaching young women how to be nurses and deaconesses. In a sense, he was the father of the modern nursing revolution in Germany, and this idea would branch out and be refined by Nightingale later on. In fact, Nightingale would train in one of his schools to be a nurse in 1850. She would also publish her first book, The Institution of Kaiserwerth on the Rhine for the Practical Training of Deaconesses, about her experience at the school. Up to this point, Nightingale was something akin to an eccentric, just a rich man's daughter who traveled as she pleased. Certainly nothing that would award her the title of a hero. This all would change with the outbreak of the Crimean War. This is going to be a super brief explanation as to what the Crimean War was, why it was fought, and who fought in it. I mention this in most of my videos where a massive conflict takes place, but they are very rarely black and white, and the reasonings as to why one side decided to take on another is similar to the mycelia of a mushroom. It's an infinite number of possible reasons that can be tracked back through the eons. However, I'll try and do my best for you all. The Crimean War was a conflict of religious ideology. 
The main cast of characters in this conflict were France, supporting the Roman Catholics, the Russians, supporting the Eastern Orthodox, and the Ottoman Empire, supporting the Sunni Islamic. The Christian groups were jumping at the opportunity to assist the Christian minority groups that were in Palestine. This, of course, was a scapegoat. Russia wanted to expand its ever-growing empire, and the coalition of France, England, and the Ottomans wanted to prevent this. Though a treaty was written up, the Ottomans kept wanting to change the terms, and thus the treaty soured. So, Russia geared up to go to war. In actuality, this was a completely unnecessary conflict that has historically been regarded as Russia attempting to overthrow an already weak powerhouse that was the Ottoman Empire. Thus, France, Russia, and the Ottomans prepared for war. The Ottomans initially held a solid defense against the Russians, but after a particularly devastating loss, the call to action of their allies was required. The Crimean War is interesting in the aspect that it was one of the first quote-unquote modern wars. This war took place between 1853 and 1856, where the invention of high-powered explosives and the revolution of firearms were in full effect. This war really almost felt like a testing ground for modern war tech, and the devastation showed. Soldiers were being brought to the infirmaries with injuries more devastating than field doctors had ever seen. Keep in mind, the cannonball was something that was still used at this time, and that completely devastates anyone that it hits. It severs limbs, heads, and chunks out of the infantrymen, but at least it killed more often than not. New Age explosives would kill, but also severely maim its victims. They would disfigure soldiers in a way that was irreparable. So, oftentimes, field doctors were forced to lay soldiers in a bed and try to soothe the pain while they slowly died. Bullets as well were a slow, painful death. Getting shot is not like how it is shown in movies and games. It's not this instantaneous bang, dead. If you're shot in the stomach, for example, the bullet, usually a lead ball at this time, buried itself into your organs where it would cauterize the fleshy tissue and cause it to weld and burn. To have it removed, a field doctor had to do a surgery with no painkillers, so you were usually biting a stick or a broom handle to stop yourself from screaming, and you watched as a guy covered in at least 30 other guys' blood cuts you open and wrenches it out. Then you die from either shock, blood loss, or infection in a bed with candlelight on the floors usually covered in blood and straw. In a word, it was hell. As for how nurses were viewed at the time, we see the best examples of this out of Charles Dickens's books. We see a nurse maid planning on stealing the fine sheets of Scrooge, now that he had passed away in the bad ending of that book. Most famously in his story, The Life and Adventures of Martin Chuzzlewit, Jesus, England, he depicts nurses through the medium of Sarah Gamp, who is incompetent, unsanitary, doesn't care for the patients under her, is a drunk, and just all around evil. The reason I tell you this is to give you a better idea as to why Nightingale is so gung-ho about her treatments. If you were surrounded by this type of environment and had this kind of a reputation for the occupation that you were going into, and that this was what was known as the norm for the time, you too would be deeply traumatized. This is exactly the world that Florence Nightingale would be stepping into in October of 1854. She was dispatched with a small group of nurses and nuns to a place almost 300 nautical miles from the British warfront. She saw the rampant death and desecration of the camp and was simply appalled. Nightingale wrote a request for help to the Times, and in response they constructed a hospital that would become known as Renkioi, which did see a significant decrease in fatalities. It has been stated by witnesses at the time that Nightingale's indomitable influence reduced patient mortality rates from 42% to 2%. This was done through the persistent demands of the staff to change the ways in which they handled hygiene. Washing hands, for example, became a forced custom in her facilities. It became clear after the first year of Nightingale's tenure that patients were dying not so much from battle wounds, but from the rampant diseases that were caused by poor sewers, poor ventilation, and improper hygiene. At the behest of Nightingale, the Sanitary Commission came out and fixed these issues, further reducing the patient mortality rate. Another action that Nightingale did was to travel around the sick ward at night with a lantern and ease the pain of the ill and injured. For this, she was given the nickname The Lady with the Lamp, immortalized in a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow called Santa Philomena. This portion goes like this. Lo in that house of misery, a lady with a lamp I see, pass through the glimmering gloom and flit from room to room. Nightingale's analytical eye came to find that the poor living conditions were the primary cause of death in soldiers that she saw. The soldiers were overtaxed mentally and physically, and were being fed poor food, and so they were unable to properly recover from their fights. Thus, Nightingale returned to Britain and reported her findings to the Royal Commission of Health for the Army. This had an enormous impact on peacetime deaths from diseases, and introduced hospital reforms that allowed for a much more sanitary work environment for doctors and soldiers. In a way, she single-handedly revolutionized an antiquated system into one that we still use to this day, 
Despite all of this, she refrained from taking credit for her achievements. The Nightingale Fund would be established in 1855 to gather money to support the training of new nurses. It was named after Nightingale by others to recognize her for her contributions to the war effort. This fund proved to be incredibly successful and Nightingale used the money to start a nursing school out of St. Thomas' Hospital. From here, she would train nurses and then send them out into the field to work, and as her reputation grew, she expanded. Today, she has a facility that is a part of King's College in London, known as the Florence Nightingale School for Nursing and Midwifery. She would also write a book known as Notes on Nursing, which would become the main textbook for her nursing schools, though it was initially written for nursing at home. The fact that it was written for the common person, however, made it a hit with the masses. Never before had a simple guide on taking care of others existed, and now it was available to all. From here, she would spend the remainder of her life educating others in the ways of nursing. One very notable example was Linda Richards, who was dubbed America's first trained nurse. She would go on to educate educate others in the ways of nursing in America and Japan. Nightingale's nurses would eventually be able to be found in major hospitals all throughout Britain. In 1883, she would become the first person to receive the Royal Red Cross, which was a medal made specifically for nurses of exceptional quality and performance. She would also receive the Lady of Grace Award of the Order of St. John, and would be the first woman to receive the Order of Merit which is an award given to people who performed exceptional military, scientific, or literary performances. Today, her birthday is celebrated as an international holiday for chronic fatigue syndrome awareness. Near the end of her life, Nightingale would suffer from bouts of depression and poor health. During this time, her contributions to nursing had slowed, though in all honesty, she had already given more than enough. She would pass in her sleep peacefully on the 13th of August, 1910. She had single-handedly revolutionized the world that we live in for the better and died in the age of 90. Her legacy is one that precedes her, having created a pledge that exists for nurses that they recite at the inception of their occupation. This is known as the Nightingale Pledge and lives on in FGO as her noble phantasm. It is read originally as follows. I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession faithfully. I shall abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous, and shall not take or knowingly administer any harmful drug. I shall do all in my power to maintain and elevate the standard of my profession, and will hold in confidence all personal matters committed to my keeping and all family affairs coming to my knowledge in the practice of my calling. I shall be loyal to my work and devoted towards the welfare of those committed to my care. But I would be remiss if I did not bring up perhaps one of the rarest things regarding Nightingale as a servant in FGO. We have an actual recording of her voice, her real voice, recorded on a wax cylinder in 1880. Let us now listen to our head nurse. But that is a very condensed life and legacy of Florence Nightingale. Thank you all so very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please let me know in the comments. If you want to request a servant, please let me know in the comments as well. Like the videos, it really does help out the channel. Subscribe to catch these as they go up. Follow my Twitch for significantly less structured content. It's a good time, I promise. But for now, keep your chins up. Peace.